good morning, or whatever it is. <laughs> As most of you will recall, perhaps somewhat painfully, for the entire history of this noble organization, we have paraded before you and in your journal uh, a never-ending sequence of human-machine anomalies experiments. Most of them, I would like to think, were uh, squeaky clean, uh, well-conceived, good protocols, protected against artifact, large databases, diligent operators, uh, seaworthy analytical business, the whole nine yards, good, clean experiments. This is not the case of the topic I'm going to describe to you today. Quite the contrary, <clears throat> this particular study I would have to regard as being quite sloppy. Nonetheless, it revealed some rather interesting evidence that you may be interested in and you may even enjoy the sloppiness of the experiment. In that array of experimental uh, efforts that I alluded to, one of the more active ones involves uh, an, uh, a random robot. You have, most of you, seen this guy. In fact, uh, some of our co-authors and staff people are, in his honor, wearing t-shirts today with his image on them. You, you will notice this. Brenda has one on over it back of the room, Lisa has one on, and, and I think there are even a couple of others. York is wearing his robot t-shirt. This little guy is maybe uh, nine or 10 inches in diameter. He looks like a little Zamboni machine. Uh, the froggy on, perched on the top as the driver of this thing uh, has a story all his own that I can't take time for. But what happens here is there is an onboard REG and a processor, a, a, a code, that uh, communicates the output of that random uh, uh, processor into a set of instructions for the robot. Tells it, move ahead, turn to the right, turn to the left, and better yet, tells it how much to move ahead and how much to, how much to turn. And so the thing executes a random two-dimensional walk on this table. And the experiments have consisted of an operator, and this is not the operator of these particular studies, sitting adjacent to this uh, platform, this table, that's about uh, four feet in diameter, and trying to induce the random motion of the thing to do something anomalous. Eventually, of course, the, the, the little froggy machine will tumble off the edge of the table. And one set of protocols we, we, we operated uh, simply was, can you get the machine to go off the other side, or you can get it to come off on your side? Uh, others, we actually looked at the angles of exit. Or we'd say, keep it on the table longer, or get it off the table more promptly. And, and we've published on this. There are references available uh, for those of you who want to follow that. However. The story now shifts into the present tense. We were in the process somewhat over a year ago of, of buttoning up the laboratory. After 28 years, as we described last, last year at this meeting, we actually decided to close down the university-based experimental program. And we were in the process of packing up equipment, unplugging stuff, uh, all sorts of uh, moving personnel or coming in and out. The idea of doing a control experiment was beyond question. We had, however, working with us a student intern, a very interesting chap. I don't want to violate his, his anonymity, but uh, this was a fellow of regal birth from the African continent who had spent time in France, very articulate, pre-medical student, who had been doing odd jobs with us on a on a uh, work-study program, who came to me and said, I love that robot experiment you did. Can I do a set of those experiments? I said, 
This thing is, is buttoned up. It's in a box. It doesn't work very well. We've only used it for demonstration purposes. And he said, no, I want to try it. So a member of our senior staff, who I think you can, can guess, uh, said, all right, fine. We haul it out. We'll set it up again, and we'll, we'll calibrate it and do the best we can to make it work. And we'll run. This person said, I'll run one set of active trials and see what happens, see if it's still viable. And indeed it was, as you'll see in a moment, and then handed it on to the student, who went on to do a much more extensive sequence of results. Now, uh, the results that this, uh, these two operators uh, acquired is on this table. You don't want to try to digest any of that. I show it to you only so you're familiar with my nomenclature. The two operators were labeled X and Y. Uh, the X was the senior laboratory person. The Y was the student. X did series A. Y did series B, C, and D. And then there were these various concatenations. And when the data we collected were the number of trials, the number that went in the desired direction, and then a bunch of, of uh, observational parameters, the total time it stayed on the table, et cetera, et cetera. I should hastily interject that we decided just to get this thing on with as simply as possible. We'd only do one protocol, and that was the time of flight protocol. Get it off the table as quickly as possible. Those would be the short trials. Leave it on the table as long as you can. Those would be the long trials. So we've got the average times of flight under these various conditions, the distributions of those times, some of the necessary statistical parameters of standard deviations and so on, which permit us to calculate the t-scores, the z-scores, the probabilities against chance, effect sizes, and all that good stuff. Now, uh, I should again uh, add that, that all of this was done with people moving equipment through the laboratory, jostling the table. At one point, the overhead camera that gave us recorded, uh, technically recorded times of flight uh, uh, got jostled, wouldn't work anymore. So I said to the student, look, we've got to finish this. Get yourself a stopwatch. And the poor kid sat there timing the trials with a stopwatch. And here are our data. Now, and that's all the bad news. But the good news is he got some striking effects, as we will display a little more facilely on this illustrative graph. Now, here are our operators, again, X and Y. Here are the series they did, A, B, C, D, and some of the combinations thereof. The, uh, the uh, blue things, the violet things here are the uh, are the z-scores uh, as computed by the usual statistical methods. And these magenta uh, bars are the effect size. I mean, we can talk, if you like, how we compute an effect size in this experiment. And look what happened. Our operator x did extraordinarily well. The green line that goes horizontally across here is the conventional 0.05 statistical significance arbitrary criterion, all right? So he's punched way through that. The effect size is way up here beyond things we normally see. And bear in mind, please, throughout, these are all differential measurements. We are distinguishing on this klutzy system between the long trial efforts, the short trial efforts, and not collectively so much as individually. These data are the differences in adjacent trials. Tries to go high, gets a time. Tries to go low, gets a time. Subtract the number, that's the measurable. Okay, and obviously we alternate the sequence of these. Now comes the student. Series B does very well also. Pass the significance criteria, again, big effect sizes. Then he does a second series. And the poor guy goes backwards. Classical Simus phenomena, way down here, and he's trying to go high, he's going low, he's trying to go low, he's going high, and he comes to me and says, what's happening? I said, no, 